Okay, so um, something was going funky, but I got it worked out. Okay, so first experiment when you heat killed the DNA or heat killed the pneumonia virus or bacteria and combined it with the non lethal kind, it would kill the mouse. So, another experiment by Avery McLeod and McCartney. What they did is they repeated it, only they purified the cell extracts. So they took all the proteins out of one, and they did the same experiment, and the same thing happened. But when they took all the DNA out, and they destroyed the DNA, and left the protein alive, the mice lived. So the conclusion then is, well, it must be the DNA then that's being transferred from one thing to the other. So another experiment, Hershey and Chase in 1952, they took bacteriophages, which are little viruses that will insert their DNA into um, bacteria, and they radio labeled the protein and the DNA. Okay, and what they found was, after they pulled all the um, bacteria out, only the radioactive DNA showed up, not the radioactive protein. So again, it must be the DNA that is being transferred, not protein. So, what is DNA? It is a nucleotide, or a nuclea nucleic acid made out of nucleotides. It has a 5-carbon sugar called deoxyribose, a phosphate group, um, which is attached to the 5' prime carbon of the sugar, and then it also has a nitrogen nitrogenous base. There are four different types of bases it may have, and there's a free hydroxyl group on the 3' prime carbon of the sugar. Now, you may be wondering, what am I talking about when I'm talking about 3'? Well, what they do is they number these carbons. You see how this is a um, kind of a ring structure here? Well, each bend is actually a carbon. So that bend there represents a carbon, and we call that the 1' prime carbon. 2' prime carbon, 3' prime carbon, 4' prime carbon, all those bends are carbons of the sugar. And then the last one is the 5 prime. So the phosphate group is attached to the 5 prime. You have a hydroxyl group on the 3 prime. And uh, then the nitrogenous base is attached to the 1 prime. Between the two um, nucleotides, you have what's called a phosphodiester bond, a phosphate molecule in between two esters. Okay, and that binds the 3 prime carbon of one to the five prime carbon of the next. So five prime and three prime is basically another way of saying like the top or the bottom. So Shagraf was another, Erwin Shargraf was another guy who um, did an experiment and he found that the number of adenine and thymine, guadenine and cytosine um, here, uh, bases, base pairs were the same. In whatever DNA molecule he found, a and T were the same, G and C were the same. And that's how we came up with the base pairing model. Rosalind Franklin, she discovered what the shape of DNA was, and she did this by performing x-ray diffractions. So that's what this is down here, that's who she is. Um, this shape denotes, or this micrograph, this x-ray, denotes that it was a helix, or a twisting ladder, basically. And she even figured out <coughs> the diameter and how long each turn is. Now the people that put it all together but didn't do any experiments were James Watson and Francis Crick. Well, they didn't do any experiments related, related to DNA. They just took everyone else's um, results and came up with a model for DNA. And that is that it's a double helix structure and the base pairs bind to each other. Okay, so you, a double helix means it has a one two twisted ladders, and then they twist around each other. So those twisted ladders are polymers of nucleotides held together by phosphodiester bonds. One is going one direction, and then the other one is anti-parallel, meaning it's going in the opposite direction. Okay, and the way we notify the direction is by the carbons. All right, the double helix then, um, the way it's held together is by hydrogen bonds between the bases. And again, this just goes back to with our A, our adenine forming a bond with thymine, two hydrogen bonds, and 
guanine forms three hydrogen bonds with cytosine. And this is what gives it a consistent diameter at any part of the um, DNA molecule. Now when DNA is replicated, um, there were three possible models that um, you get two new strands from one old strand. The idea was maybe it's conserved, a conservative model where the new strand is actually two new strands and the old strand is kept in place. Or semi-conservative where you have one old strand and one new strand in each of your new strands. And dispersive was, well, it's a combination of the two. They're all just chunks of each. And um, research showed that it was actually the semi-conservative model that won out. That's how it's replicated. And we know how it works um, based on our you know, biochemistry experiments that have been done on it. But uh, it requires three things. First, you have to have something to copy, and that's our DNA. You have to have um, proteins that are able to do the work, and those are enzymes. And then you have to have the building blocks to make the copy. So you have to have nucleotides to be able to put together to make a new strand. And we break this down into three processes. Initiation, which is the start. Elongation, which is adding more. And then termination, which is once you're all done. Okay, there are a few rules of replication. One, bases are added to the three prime end. You can't be added to the five prime end. So this is basically saying you can't add a base to the top. That has to be added to the bottom. So they are synthesized in the five prime to three prime direction. And this requires an enzyme called DNA polymerase, which adds nu nucleotides to that three prime end. So that means uh, this new strand if it wanted to add a new nucleotide, it couldn't add it to this end, the 5' prime end. They would have to add it to the 3' prime end. Okay, you have a few enzymes. One's called DNA polymerase, and what it does is it matches up your A's and your G's and your C's and your T's by adding a new base or a new nucleotide to the 3' prime end. Again, it has to be in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, and it requires a primer. So, Replication is a little bit different in the in prokaryotes as it is in eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, as you remember, their chromosomes are circular. So you have replication that begins at an origin, and then it goes in both directions until it gets to a termination, and then you have two circular chromosomes when you're done. Pretty, pretty simple process. It does require multiple DNA polymerases. DNA polymerase 1 acts on a lagging strand, and I'll show you what that means in a second, and it removes those RNA primers and replaces them with DNA. DNA polymerase 2 um, repairs any errors that may have been made, and DNA polymerase 3 is what mainly does the replication. It adds the nucleotides to the end. All can read the DNA for mistakes and then take out nucleotides when necessary, and that's done by what's, and that ability is called exonuclease activity. DNA polymerase 1 is also able to do that in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So it can read it both ways, while the other ones can only read it one way. We have a few enzymes because <coughs> they're all wound up. We have a few enzymes that help keep things um, from getting all twisted up and, and not being able to work. One's called helicase, which opens opens it up to begin with. It unwinds the DNA. You have single-stranded binding proteins, which keeps it open for a period of time so that the enzymes can work. And you have topoisomerase, which keeps it from supercoiling. So you see over here in this picture, this is a supercoil. Basically, when you unwind here, it's going to cause strain here. Topoisomerase is able to un undo that supercoiling. So the process of replication is semi-discontinuous, meaning um, it doesn't it it happens in chunks. Okay, DNA polymerase, like we said before, can only add to the three prime end, and so one of these, because they're in opposite direction, one of the strands can be continuously just add another one onto the as it opens up, it adds on another nucleotide, but the other one is going in the opposite direction. So as it opens up, you have to put on a primer and then it has to go in the other direction. So it, it does it in fragments called Okazaki fragments. 
So at the replication fork, which is partially open, it doesn't open the whole thing at once. It opens uh, a very small part of it. And then it adds um, primers. An enzyme called DNA primase adds the RNA primers, which then allows DNA polymerase to read and add nucleotides. The leading strand only needs one of these primers, and then it can just go. The lagging strand has to have a bunch of little primers because it has to do things in chunks. Ligase then, after you have these different chunks all uh, replaced by DNA polymerase, there's a little bit that has to be bound and ligase seals those nicks. And then once it's all done, gyrase unlinks uh, the copies from each other. Okay, so this is these are the main enzymes that we just talked about. DNA polymerase, you have primase putting on the primer, there's the primer, RNA primer, DNA polymerase goes in and puts on the nucleotides, the lagging strand does it in little chunks, the leading st strand just does one after another, and then ligase comes in and, and seals the nicks in between them. The actual process is a little more complicated because you have um, a big protein that is guiding the whole process. Um, which has different clamps, which will open and close it. Um, but the, the main players are still there. The eukaryote replication is a little bit more complicated because it has more DNA, and the chromosomes are linear. So rather than just going from one end to the other and being done in a circular fashion, you have the ends that you have to deal with. So one of the enzymes that helps you with that is called telomerase. Also, there are multiple places where it starts. It starts in places called replicons. Rather than just having one side of origin and going both ways in prokaryotes, it does it in a bunch of different places, and then they all meet up to, to finish the chromosome. Also, the initiation phase is much more complicated. It requires a lot more factors, more um, enzymes, and, and other chunks of protein to get it started. Um, and then also primase is needed for both DNA and RNA polymerase. So the telomeres are the ends of the proteins, and they are ends of the chromosomes. And what they allow the chromosome to do is um, maintain the integrity of the linear chromosome um, from nucleases, which will digest them. Over time, they will be gradually shortened if it weren't for um, telomerase. So what happens at the very end is you have this chunk where the primer wasn't able to get on there um, and over time that would just have to be cut off and you would have a shortened template if it weren't for telomerase. What it does is it adds an RNA primer which repeats these little uh, repeated sequence, sequences like AT, 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 AT. Um, and then it replaces it with DNA so that you still have the same amount that you had before. So sometimes, though, when in this process of replication, DNA um, isn't always replicated properly. Um, and so you have multiple opportunities to correct that with our DNA polymerases. They have proofreading ability and are able to remove things when possible. A mutagen is something that causes um, an increase in the number of errors. Radiation will do that. There are lots of chemicals that will do that. Mutagen is also the name of the secret ooze, which turns the turtles into ninja turtles on ninja turtles. So a very accurate name in that cartoon. Um, DNA uh, repair is very important, and it's very repetitive. So it can happen on multiple levels in replication indicating it is very, very important. There are two general categories. There's specific repair, where there's just a single lesion, a specific type of DNA damage that is repaired. And then there's also non-specific, where it doesn't matter what's happened there. Um, it will go in, and it will fix it. And we have two examples of this. Photo repair, what happens is, is UV light, so light, UV radiation in light, will cause two thymines to bond to bind to each other rather than to bind to the adenines across from them. 
and this causes a problem. Um, so we have an enzyme called photolyase, and what it does is it absorbs light and uses that light to break that thymine dimer and then uses that energy to reform bonds between the adenine and thymine. Excision repair, like I said, is a little more general. It doesn't really matter what the problem is. Um, and all it does, it has three steps. It, take, it recognizes that there's a problem. Something is warped, not binding correctly. It will remove a little chunk of the damaged region. And then it will allow DNA polymerase to go in there and fix the damage. Okay, It doesn't really matter. It's nonspecific. It's just going to take out whatever's there, and they're going to replace it with something new. All right. And that's it for um, DNA and our genes for this lecture. We're going to continue with more stuff next time.